Railroad trains over Tennessee Pass. The Rio Grande Zephyr snaking its way through the scenic canyons. This is mountain railroading Colorado style. But in another time, it was steam-powered narrow-gauge trains over the high passes. And it was narrow-gauge luxury passenger trains out of Durango and the mixed train to Santa Fe. In southwestern Colorado, the Rio Grande Southern made its roundabout way from Durango to Ridgeway. From Denver, the Colorado and Southern ran trains to Golden, Idaho Springs, Georgetown, Black Hawk, Central City, Como, Fairplay, Leadville, and other famous towns of the mining era. Let's go back now to the years before World War II as we take an excursion to the 30s aboard the last narrow gauge railroads of Colorado. August 11, 1939. Engine number 70 is switching at Idaho Springs as we begin our tour in the mountains west of Denver on the Colorado and Southern Railway. The tracks had been completed here in April of 1877 as part of the Colorado Central Railroad. The engine is seen passing Argo Tunnel Mine, which is still a landmark along Interstate 70 at Idaho Springs. The train is seen here backing to Black Hawk, just north of Forks Creek. was the railroad's first objective with the tracks reaching there in December of 1872. The tracks were not extended to Central City until May 31, 1878, a little over a year after the railroad had reached Idaho Springs. Returning to Forks Creek, a flying switch is made with Caboose 1003. We make the run between Golden and Forks Creek. The 13 miles through the scenic canyon from Golden to Forks Creek were completed in September of 1872 and was advertised as the Grand Canyon of Clear Creek. now covers the railroad right-of-way. Forks Creek 
Creek is an interesting junction on the Colorado and Southern narrow gauge. A ride divides the route with one leg headed toward Blackhawk and the other continuing on to Idaho Springs. scenes of the Clear Creek Division of the Colorado and Southern Railway. Milepost 151, Leadville, Colorado, at an altitude of over 10,000 feet. The Denver South Park and Pacific a predecessor of the Colorado and Southern, reached there in 1884 by way of the High Line over Boreas Pass. The silver, gold, lead, and zinc markets declined, but in the 30s, molybdenum, a rare metal used in strengthening steel, became one of Colorado's most important industries. On July 6, 1938, engine number 74 is switching cars for the run to the Climax molybdenum mine. Denver South Park and Pacific was changed to standard gauge in 1943. It is 1938 and the line between Climax, Breckenridge, over Boreas Pass to Como will be abandoned. Then the line from Como over Kenosha Pass to South Platte will be removed. So while we can, let's follow engines 71, 8, and 69 as they leave Breckenridge en route to Como. There is no fire in number 8, and this is an equipment transfer prior to abandonment. side of Kenosha Pass. Summit. 
the west side of Kenosha Pass. Engine 69 is helping. southern narrow gauge and all track will be removed by 1943. To the south of Leadville, down the Arkansas River is Salida and the Denver and Rio Grande Western Railroad. An interesting operation out of Salida is the 15 and a half mile Monarch branch. Gondolas of limestone which is used in the Pueblo steel mills are brought down from the quarries at Monarch. Not even a 4.5% maximum grade to get the rails to Monarch at an altitude of over 10,000 feet, so a switchback was incorporated. At Garfield, with 490 as the lead engine and 491 in the middle, the train is split and each section goes through the switchback. In Salida, a big standard gauge class L131 rolls by. It was built at Brooks in 1927 and will be scrapped in 1956. The Shivano is one of the last narrow gauge luxury passenger trains and standard gauge switcher 1173 is making up the train now. Its destination is Gunnison, Colorado, a distance of 73 and a half miles, and it will climb over Marshall Pass at an altitude of 10,856 feet. Our road engine is K-28 number 479. During World War II, the Army will use this engine on the White Pass and Yukon in Alaska, and it will be scrapped in 1946.
altitudes of 4% and through 24 degree curves, we reach the summit of Marshall Pass. At Pollen, we meet a freight bound for Salida with double-headed engines 492 and 496. 499 is pushing. We've arrived at our destination, Gunnison, Colorado. The mail is unloaded from the RPO. From the top of the coal dock, we can see the Gunnison Roundhouse with engines 479 and 361, a small outside frame 280. The shortened train continues on to Montrose through the Black Canyon of the Gunnison. From a caboose in the Black Canyon of the Gunnison, we get a brief look at the Kerikani Needle, which was a long-time corporate symbol of the Denver Rear Grand. Engine 361 is providing the power. In the dual gauge yards of Montrose, Colorado, narrow gauge engine number 454 is switching standard gauge cars. This engine was built in 1903 and will last until 1953 with a lifespan of 50 years. Ridgeway and a connection with the Rio Grande Southern.
Engineers began work on the Rio Grande Southern Railroad at Ridgeway and at Durango about the same time in April of 1890. The last spike was driven December 20th, 1891. The line is 162 miles long and finally connects Ridgeway, Rico, and Telluride to Durango. <laughs> GW number 463, K27, will have a long life as it will be sold to Gene Autry in 1955 and later will be returned to Colorado. Here it is, switching at Ridgeway Depot. Southern engine 455 was bought from the rear frame in 1939 and will have a hectic life. It will be wrecked in 43, rebuilt in 47, and finally dismantled in 1953. Another Rio Grande Southern train is upgrade on Dallas Divide with engines 42 and 40 as helpers. survived to run for a short time at an amusement park west of Denver, and then it is placed on display there. Number 40 is scrapped in 1943. The trestles at Ophir are one of the engineering marvels on the Rio Grande Southern. Lizard Head Pass is the highest point on the railroad at 10,250 feet.
Engine 41 is sent to Knott's Berry Farm in 1952. Engines 42 and 41 cross Leitner Creek Trestle. This trestle is 53 feet high and 349 feet long. Southern Freight crosses the Animus River into Durango. Over the 4th of July of 1938, Victor Miller of the Rio Grande Southern runs a special train over the entire route for John Barriger, president of the Monon Railroad. The train consists of engine number 25, a coach, and business car B20. This is the Durango smelter. Ore came here on narrow gauge trains from many directions. In fact, Durango is known as the narrow gauge capital of the world. And no wonder, because lines extend in all directions. The Silverton branch to the north, the Alamosa main line to the east, the Rio Grande Southern to the west, and the Farmington branch to the south. Durango is a company town, platted and developed by the Rio Grande. The tracks arrived on July 27, 1881 and no time was lost in constructing the Silverton branch. Our first excursion out of Durango is on this branch, and we find the Durango switcher number 271 at work in the yards. 271 is a C-16 class 280 built by Baldwin in 1882. The crew is assembling the mixed train to Silverton. Leaving Durango, just as it does in later years, the train crosses the Animus River. And past the Hermosa water tank. had not yet discovered the train, and it consists of freight cars, a combine, and caboose. Here is the spectacular ledge at Rockwood above the Animus River. And this is Silverton. When the trains first arrived here only a year after reaching Durango, the mines in the vicinity produced $20 million in gold and silver. Otto Mears quickly built three short feeder lines, and we can take a quick tour of the mines on the Silverton Northern. The Silver Lake Mill. The 
the Shenandoah Dives Mill and Tramway, which began operation in 1933 during the Depression. The Sunnyside Mill at Eureka and the Casey Jones Rail Bus. This is the only thing left of a Silverton, Gladstone, and Northerly boxcar at the site of the Welsh smelter at Silverton. To the north from Silverton is the Million Dollar Highway and the route of the Silverton Railroad. The railroad didn't make it all the way to Uray, but we can make a short auto trip on over to Uray by way of Red Mountain Pass. Uray is in a beautiful box canyon with rail access only to the north and is served by the DNRGW from Montrose. At this time, the Million Dollar Highway is still a gravel road. Again we pass Silverton, and after encountering a minor obstacle, we pass Mullis Lake and we're on our way back to Durango. To the south of Durango is the Farmington Branch. It was originally laid to standard gauge, then later changed to narrow gauge. Oil is the reason for this branch, and here we see number 478 with a train of Conoco tank cars. gauge main line from Durango to Chama and Alamosa handles heavy freight trains and requires the largest rear grand narrow gauge engines. Here 482 and 483 are eastbound near Durango.
76 eases out of the roundhouse and onto the turntable. station. as it runs beside the Animus River near Carbon Junction. It has 10 plush swivel chairs and one dining table capable of serving four persons at a time. Just in front of the dining table is a small kitchen. A favorite among the children on the train is the ice cream bars available from this kitchen. For service on the Silverton train, the car will be changed to a coach, but in 1981 it is modified back to an extra fare power car after the purchase of the line by Charles E. Bradshaw, Jr. At Gato, we see both the eastbound and westbound San Juan. we climb. 
behind Cumbers Pass. on the way up to Windy Point and Cumber Summit. After a short pause at Cumbers, we'll be on our way down the east side of Cumbers Pass. After a stop at Lava Tank, the train will continue on to Anzanita and Alamosa. Upon leaving Alamosa, the westbound San Juan is combined with train number 425, the mixed train to Santa Fe. It's known as the Chili Train. separated and the San Juan departs to the west for Durango. Four seventy five will be the motive power for the Chili train. For the boxcar, two flats loaded with brand new 1940 automobiles, a reefer, a railway post office car, and a coach, the Chili train leaves Anzanita for Santa Fe, New Mexico.
Taos and Taos Pueblo are a few miles to the east. We cross the Rio Grande River and will soon be arriving at Santa Fe. Mexican influence is very evident in Santa Fe architecture. The approach to the Santa Fe Depot is right down the middle of the city streets. return trip to Alamosa. Since there's no caboose, Coach 284 has a special bay window so that the conductor can keep an eye on the train. The chilly train on the return trip again crosses the Rio Grande River. The Chile train is abandoned just before the beginning of World War II, and the usefulness of narrow-gauge steam locomotives and wooden cars as a common carrier will soon be over. Fans and tourists will be the savior of many spectacular miles of narrow-gauge track. The narrow-gauge have done a job well, and now with a new purpose, at least a few locomotives and cars will continue to roll through the same countryside as it did in the 1800s and in the 1900s and into the next century.